All right, so this is the last section for, or I guess last unit for section three. So after this uh, PowerPoint is done, this will be the end of the material for the test coming up. Oh, is it Monday? So um, whatever I don't, so far away, right? Um, whatever I don't finish today, I'll do, uh, I think tomorrow's our review session. So I'll try to finish that up there. Um, in the past, what I had done is I would record an extra video that you would watch and then come I in. Mean, students did not like having to do extra work as it turns out. So um, I'll just try to finish up in the review session and we'll do whatever review we can for the Kahoot, okay? Anywho, let's discuss some biology. So we're talking about uh, endocrine control of reproduction. We're gonna talk about the male and female reproductive system. We'll get into the uh, menstrual cycle and then finally talk about some fertilization. So reproduction, here's some products of reproduction. I just use this as an opportunity to, to dote on my children. So I have a uh, little Lily over here. She's two right now, and then I have little Phoebe. They look so similar when they're so young like that, so precious. I didn't realize they do like bougie, like uh, day one photo shoots uh, for babies. Um, and boy, is there a price to go along with that. But you're like a new parent, you're like, whatever, just do it. I don't care what it costs. And then, yeah. Okay. But here's what they look like now. So here's Lily. She's practicing. She's so good at medicine, she needs two stethoscopes just to. Poor thing. Uh, and then uh, we have Phoebe here. She's, she's about seven months old now. So Very cute little children, if I do say so myself. However, I'm a little biased. All right, so let's look at reproduction. So um, basically what we're seeing here is that obviously everyone gets made from one egg and one sperm, as the case may be. And so um, how do we develop those eggs and sperms? What process? Meiosis. Remember, we talked about all that. So we're going to go over that a little bit here. Uh, um, in just a few minutes, but basically as you have that fusion occurs is when uh, fertilization happens. We'll talk uh, about that in a little bit more detail, but basically you develop these zygotes here. Now notice depending whether it's XY, XY means male baby, and then XX means female baby, right? So again, I uh, apparently can only donate X chromosomes as the case may be, at least as far as I know, there may be other children out there, but at this point, <laughs> mostly X's. And then what you'll see is that as uh, as the development actually occurs here, you know, you start off with these indifferent gonads, which I always think is kind of a funny term. Gonads are like, eh, I don't care what I am. Testes, ovaries, whatever. But eventually you're going to have uh, this TDF, this testes determining factor, if that's present, which uh, is going to be in the case when you have these Y chromosomes here. Um, you're going to see this will develop into testes. And then uh, if not, then they actually will devote, develop into the ovaries, okay? Um, we'll see how that development occur over time. Uh, and then we'll get into the details on each of these. We're talking about things like the seminiferous tubules and interstitial cells and all that good stuff, and then talk about the ovaries in, in great detail. So, um, again, as I mentioned, females typically have two X chromosomes. Um, again, in that case, female is always going to pass on an X chromosome to their offspring, and then the guys have the choice uh, or the, the chances of passing on a Y chromosome, as the case may be. I tried to really think about a boy for the second one, but it just didn't work. So apparently, uh, <laughs> mind over matter does not work in these cases here. Um, but again, the sex ends up getting determined by that contributing uh, sperm there. So... Looking at after the fertilization, you're going to find um, you know the gonads and the associated structures tend to be actually identical between both a, a male and a female uh, a baby at this point, right? So again, you're going to find that depending on how uh, things will develop based on certain um, hormonal sort of secretions, you're going to find this can uh, develop either into the ovaries or in the testes, as the case may be here. So we'll get some more pictures of that in just a few minutes. Um, but again, the first thing is going to be signaling. This is going to be the those testes determining factor that TDF will stimulate either, either to develop into uh, ovaries if it's not there or develop into testes if it is present. So you your picture kind of showing the same thing we saw just a minute ago. Right, so then looking at this, you're going to find that other hormones are going to be playing a role here as well. So again, let's go down the male pathway here. So again, if we have the test, uh, testes, obviously they're going to be producing things like testosterone, which we'll go into more detail later on. But um, you also have this, uh, this MIF, which stands for this Mullerian in inhibition factor here. And so basically, you can find that different portions of the gonads will actually either be developed or will uh, basically atrophy, depending on if they have uh, these, these hormones present, right? So in the case here where we have this Mullerian inhibition factor, you find that this, uh, this one particular duct here, the malarian duct will actually degenerate versus for the female, you're going to find they don't have that factor around that inhibition factor. It will then develop into things like the uterus, right? So again, um, I probably won't get so specific uh, onto detail here, but again, know that the main determining thing for, for males is going to be the testosterone and the testes determining factor. Those are two kind of the main ones that are going to help the development of uh, the male sex organs there, right? Again, for the female, they're not going to have any presence of testosterone, so all these things will, will degenerate or then develop into things like uh, the labia, the clitoris, the uh, vagina, all of that. I think it's kind of an interesting picture kind of showing the development here. I can see how um, the same color tissue is shared between the two. You can see how they can kind of develop into either uh, into the male sex organs or, or the female sex organs, as the case may be. 
Okay, so I want to get into the actual physiology itself. Let's talk about the endocrine regulation of reproduction. So let's go back to our friend, the pituitary gland. What are uh, the main hormones we're going to be looking at here as far as regulation of um, reproduction? FSH, which stands for? Follicle stimulating hormone and then luteinizing hormone or LH, right? So you can see those uh, being secreted here. Again, both of these are going to be present in males and females. And again, these are going to follow the same sort of uh, negative feedback loops we've seen with other um, aspects of this was as far as uh, the HPA axis. We'll talk about prolactin a little bit. What does prolactin help with? Actual breast milk production, right? Remember where the other hormone was useful in helping with uh, the letdown of the milk? Yeah, oxytocin, right? So, so prolactin typically is going to be stimulating uh, production of milk, then you have the oxytocin help with the, the light down there. But we'll focus uh, probably more on LH and FSH for this, uh, our purposes today. So, again, we're going to call this the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis here. And again, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are the primary things we're going to be talking about. Um, the anterior pituitary is going to be producing both of these, despite if it's male or female patient. And what you'll find is that it will help to stimulate with things like spermatogenesis, so the formation of sperm, or this oogenesis, the development of the, um, uh, the eggs. And then you'll also have things like stimulation of gonadal hormone secretion. So for males, it's predominantly what? Testosterone for females. Estrogen, what else? We're also see progesterone is going to be a big player there as well, right? So does that mean that guys don't produce any estrogen or progesterone? We still can produce some, right? We still have some interconversions that can happen there. However, it'll be much less uh, than female patients, right? Uh, similarly, can females produce testosterone? Absolutely, right? It's, they can produce a little bit, but it's going to be, again, the lesser amounts you see in the male patient, okay? And again, it's helpful with the maintenance of structures of the gonads here. So looking at this, you can see that um, a lot of these are going to be undergoing um, this kind of circadian rhythms. When I say circadian rhythm, what does that mean? You know, this daily variation that can happen, right? So again, everything has uh, a bit of a rhythm to it. So you can find here that like luteinizing hormone, for instance, um, has this uh, kind of uh, this kind of undulating sort of uh, uh, release and in, in, uh, inhibition, as we'll see here. Again, this is all negative feedback loop, right? So in both cases, when you're looking at like a male patient with the testes, you're going to see the feedback of testosterone and inhibin will shut down release of both FSH and LH, and then also shut down uh, release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, right? So don't forget that that's kind of the top of the, the whole pyramid here. And then also looking at the ovaries, you know, progest, uh, estrogen and progestin and also some inhibin will then feed back as well and, and stop the system. So for instance, if I was trying to say, um, prevent someone from getting pregnant and preventing ovulation, how could I do that? I can give them a whole lot of estrogen and actually shut down this whole system here. So that's the, basically the concept behind things like oral contraceptives is I'll give them estrogen and progesterone and I'll actually neg have a negative feedback effect here. And we'll look at ovulation a little bit later. But you see this actually will help, uh, help to shut the system down and prevent the female from ovulating. And then you can't get pregnant for the most part, right? Not everything's perfect, but that's, that's usually the goal there. I was talking about um, one of my other classes, I was, I was discussing um, SIP enzyme in, uh, interactions, right? So you remember like when you induce SIP enzymes, that can increase metabolism, certain things, you can have uh, reductions in, uh, of levels, right? So again, it goes back to your pharmacodynamics you're probably studying for right now. Um, but uh, one of those things you can find is actually estrogens. You can actually have an inducer on board that will actually drop your levels of estrogen. And said, you know, what could be a potential side effect from that uh, if you're taking like oral contraceptives? And what do you think? And get a pregnancy, right? And so that's an adverse reaction that lasts for at least 18 years. You know, it can lead to <laughs> symptoms of sleep deprivation, uh, migraines, uh, depression, an empty wallet. You know, so it's like it's serious side effects can happen here. You really need to take your drug interactions into account. Um, all right, so let's dive deeper into the male reproductive system. I thought this cartoon was very funny, but <laughs> anywho, I always have a number of people like I don't get that, but just ask your friends. Anywho. Um, <laughs> So let's look at the chemistry of the androgens themselves. Again, we're looking at these hormones. Again, they're all basically having these steroids. They all basically have the same sort of uh, four ring structure here. So you're going to see this looks very similar to things like cortisol. It's going to look very similar to aldosterone, uh, progesterone, estrogen. They all look very similar to one another. The two main ones we're going to be talking about for uh, male patients are going to be the testosterone. And then we also have something that gets converted into it, this dihydrotestosterone. So you see DHT, that's what we're referring to is dihydrotestosterone. Anyone know which one's more potent? DHT actually ends up being the more potent of the two. So um, basically what you're going to find, there, uh, find that there's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase that will convert that testosterone into DHT. Okay. So again, testosterone is the main uh, androgen. And again, we're talking about you know male uh, reproductive hormones. We're talking about androgens. Not, uh, and again, some people get confused when I say like adrenergic. Adrenergic just means things like adrenaline, like your sympathetic nervous system. This is androgen. So make sure you keep those two straight. 
Basically, you'll produce testosterone, but then that 5-alpha reductase will convert it over into DHT. Okay, This will be important. We're talking about things like treatment of BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, we're talking about things like prostate cancer. This, this will, enzyme will come up again and again, as we'll see later on. Anyway, typically, uh, these, these uh, steroids are going to get eliminated and uh, metabolized within the liver. So again, they don't have renal clearance necessarily, but they do get excreted in the bile. Uh, some amount will be in the urine, but a lot of it is going to go through this liver metabolism here. Okay. Now, again, um, males still produce some amount of estrogens. You can find some of that testosterone and actually get converted over. There's an enzyme called aromatase, uh, which I'll talk about later on, but they'll help to convert that testosterone over into estrogen. And so, um, you know, typically uh, males should be producing roughly 20% of, say, like a non-pregnant female. Anyone know what happens to uh, pregnant females or their estrogen levels? Typically go up. They typically go pretty, pretty significantly there. But anyway, um, we'll talk about that later. But 20% uh, roughly they should be producing uh, some amount of estrogen. Um, and so basically what you find is when you're producing these, these uh, steroids, they're going to be getting down into the actual... Uh, into the cells to work on the nucleus to change things like gene transcription, uh, protein production, et cetera, right? So again, just like cortisol works at the level of the nucleus, these are doing very similar actions here, okay? Now, I said the testes are producing uh, this testosterone. Anyone know uh, anywhere else where you produce some androgens in the body? So remember in the adrenal glands, remember there's a couple of different things we're producing. So there's cortisol, there's aldosterone. There's also going to be some androgens that get produced there as well. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a moment. So looking at secretion of FSH and LH, which is coming from the, uh, the anterior pituitary, um, you'll typically find that it actually gets kind of elevated at birth, right? So these uh, red and green lines are LH and, and FSH. Um, and so you notice kind of intrauterine weeks. How long is a full-term birth? Remember? 37 to 40, somewhere around there. So again, you notice that these levels will stay high. And then as they are born, you're going to see that it will be, uh, you'll have some spikes of it here in the neonatal months. But then what do you notice about it? It kind of drops to zero for the most part uh, until what, what age? Kind of early teens, right? And what happens in your early teens? Puberty, right? So that's when puberty is going to get you kicking in, right? So you're going to see that um, you'll have kind of this, uh, this uh, quiescent period here. We're not really having any FSH or LH being produced here. And then you'll find it starts to peak back up when we get into um, the actual puber, uh, pubertal development, right? So we actually hit puberty. And again, you notice during these, these periods here, that's important that it's elevated because we want to help develop you know, the testes and the penis and all that, right? Um, so again, you'll see the pretty similar aspects here when we talk about females as well a little bit later on. All right. And again, looking at, um, you know, the actual growth uh, as a function of sex and age, what do you kind of notice about females as far as when they hit their growth spurt? So sooner or later than guys? Typically sooner, right? So, you know, I remember that really intimidating year in, in, uh, in uh, middle school, I guess, when all the girls came back and they grew like a couple inches. And you're like, oh, man, they got so big. Um, <laughs> but then guys typically hit their growth spurt a little bit afterwards. And that's, again, going to be kind of a function of, you know, when they're hitting puberty, when LH and FSH start to go up. And again, as we are producing these new hormones, things like testosterone, you know, is that anabolic or catabolic? Catabolic. Catabolic? Anabolic. Testosterone is an anabolic hormone, right? Um, so again, that's when you start to see this growth here. You're going to see that as growth in centimeters per year, it's going to be pretty steady for the most part until you hit puberty, and then you're going to have a big spike here. Again, guys are a little bit later than, than females, as the case may be. I think by the time you're 18 or so, you should be roughly done at, uh, growing at that point. So, and then as you see, when they hit puberty, you're going to get these secondary sex characteristics that will develop. Again, this is where you're going to have the, the growth spurts. You're going to develop, uh, you know, your skeletal muscle, uh, penis and testes are going to develop. And you're also going to have uh, body hair is going to be stimulated by these androgens, right? Um, and typically, you're going to find that you have uh, some development here actually coming from this uh, zona reticularis here. Remember, there's some androgens releasing that part of the, the uh, adrenal gland there that will also help with the development of things like, you know, body hair and, and et cetera. Again, just here some charts are kind of showing at uh, uh, kind of the tanner stages of puberty. And again, you kind of be uh, using this to describe uh, patients depending on how developed they are or not, as the case may be. But you'll start to see things like uh, looking at growth, you know, how much growth they're having per year, um, you know, say five to six centimeters when they're kind of pre-pubertal uh, versus when they're kind of getting up into full peak velocity. You know, it could be, you know, say 10 centimeters per year that they're growing. Um, so just look at the development, kind of see what's going, what's going on there. I'm not going to get so specific to ask you, like, on stage two, what's happening for the males. But just know this is the general development, right? You're going to see body hair growth spurts, muscle develop, the voice is going to deepen, you know, all this kind of change you'd expect to see with, with puberty. Again, looking here at the actual hormonal stimulation of such things, so again, looking at the different factors here, so again, uh, pubic hair and body growth and all these different things, uh, what do you notice kind of being the main hormonal stimulation? 
testosterone, which makes sense because, again, our LH and FSH are starting to uh, be, uh, come up regulated. We're going to see that's going to have a stimulatory effect on the testes to produce testosterone, okay? Um, you also see things like growth hormone going to be a big uh, deal here, especially as far as, like, the body growth, as far as height goes. Um, growth hormone is going to be uh, important for the growth of the testes as well, but predominantly testosterone is going to be the, the main thing here is helping to uh, develop these male patients at, um, at puberty. Again, other androgen effects you can see for these patients include things like male, uh, male pattern baldness. And again, there could be some, uh, a lot of genetic background influences on this, and not everyone just because you have a certain testosterone level is going to become bald. You know, the next day it just depends. Um, you can also see things like increased uh, uh, skin thickness. Um, androgens typically will lead to uh, worsened acne in a lot of cases. Uh, this is mainly due to increased sebum production. What is sebum? Anyone know? Kind of the oil and stuff that you're producing in those follicles that are going to be um, um, or in the pores that are basically going to be clogging things up and that's where we're going to see these bacteria start to develop and grow there's an anaerobic bacteria that cause acne and uh, we'll talk about that later on in, in farm one but again that's one of the things you can see there again when you hit um you know when you hit puberty i don't know if anyone else had pizza face but you know, it's one of those things you, you can see there um not that i have any lingering uh issues with that but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, again, protein muscle development is going to be happening uh, during this phase. Bone deposition. So we see that, um, again, testosterone typically has pro effects on the bone. Some of that due to the fact that it gets converted to estrogen and it's going to have uh, positive effects there as well. Um, increased red blood cell production. And then there's another big thing, increased prostate size. You know, what increases the prostate size in a female patient? Ah, they don't have prostate, right? So again, keep that in mind. Kind of a male issue, right? So again, benign prostatic hyperplasia can be one of the big things you'll actually see with that. And again, one of the things we'll see when we get into treatment of BPH is actually it's not only just the testosterone that you're forming there, but it's also what was that other hormone I mentioned? DHT, the dihydrotestosterone. So that's also going to be playing a big role here. And uh, some of that testosterone gets converted. 5-alpha reductase converts that to DHT. That is more potent of an androgen than you're going to see than just testosterone by itself. Okay, so looking at the actual um, negative feedback loop here, we're going to see that the uh, hypothalamus is going to release what? Gonadotropin releasing hormone, right? And that's going to release onto the anterior pituitary, which produces LH, LH and FSH. Good. And so then we go down here to the testes. You're going to see this will stimulate testosterone production. And then also we're going to see spermatogenesis is going to be stimulated by this, okay? Now, again, the two main things you're going to be feeding back and inhibiting the system are going to be one testosterone itself, right? So it's kind of acting as its own negative feedback loop. But then you're also going to have this inhibitor that's going to be produced as well, right? And again, this kind of makes sense because if you hear about people who maybe are taking testosterone exogenously, so say someone got a supplement for testosterone and was administering it to themselves, what happens to the testes? They kind of shrink. You have testicular atrophy that happens due to the fact that we are now activating that negative feedback loop. Very similar to how if I give estrogens to a female patient, I can inhibit ovulation. Same thing can happen to male patients. I'm inhibiting things like testosterone production because I'm feeding back and inhibiting this and then also decreasing that spermatogenesis. Testes don't really have a job to do so much anymore, so they will then atrophy, right, because they don't have to produce their own uh, testosterone. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. Um, you may see kind of like long-standing effects, depending on on kind of when they were first using it or what time frame they were using. And certainly, some of those changes may be permanent. So, for instance, um, actually, kind of one of the interesting things I think is is that nowadays we have patients who are you know. Um, I want to get myself in trouble. I want to make sure you use the right terminology, but you know, non-gender binary or people who want to maybe go undergo, um, you know, uh, sex change via uh, hormones. You know, so for instance, like, well, how young is too young, or is there a too young a period? Because again, a lot of times uh, for those patients, you know, they want to start as early as possible, especially before, before puberty. Because again, once you go through puberty, those changes th those are permanent, right? Once you develop those uh, secondary characteristics. Um, so yeah, some of those changes could be permanent. A lot of times, if you're seeing like, for instance, uh, if I have like a, a female patient who's taking estrogens and progestins to inhibit ovulation, once they go off of it things will go right back to normal, right? Uh, once patients come off the testosterone, then the testicles will start to pick up production again. Very similar to if I were to give someone a stare, like a glucocorticoid, what happens to the adrenal glands? They atrophy too, right? Because again, they don't have to produce their own cortisol. As I take that away, the adrenal glands will then start to pick back up. So again, the same, same thing is happening here regardless. Um, but again, with these sort of hormones, depending on when it's happening, the, the, the effects could be uh, permanent in some cases, especially the earlier on you're administering them, right? Um, and in fact, some cases, like we have kids who have um, things like pituitary tumors that have to be removed. And then once you remove 
you know, the, produ uh, the ability to produce things like LH and FSH or uh, growth hormone, we have to supplement that, right? So we have to kind of figure out like when do they start, when would they start puberty and then maybe starting them on some of these hormones in order to replace what they can't really produce anymore themselves. So it's kind of an interesting sort of thing there looking at uh, things like growth hormone replacement, et cetera, for the young kids. And we saw that a lot. I actually did, um, I got to volunteer one time at the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind in St. Augustine. And a lot of those kids, the reason why they're blind is due to these tumors. They had to have uh, something cut out and that also affected the pituitary. Because if you look at the, you know, the optic nerve and where the pituitary is, they're, they're pretty close together. And so a lot of times they had that blindness as a result of uh, their disease state and then also had these pituitary issues. They had a ton of hormones that they were on to try to replace a lot of those. Again, these are, you know, starting to become teenage kids and stuff. So does that answer your question? Sort of. Kind of a long way to say it. Anywho. So typically, though, uh, especially if they're post-puberty, um, once you take these drugs away and once you take these hormones away, if you were to modify them, they would just go back to the normal, whatever that patient's normal may be. Okay. Um, all right. So going back to the male reproductive system here, we see that um, when testosterone is produced, you're going to find that it kind of more predominantly inhibits LH more so than FSH. And then we're also going to find that uh, you'll produce inhibin in these Sertoli cells. These, uh, we're going to go cover the actual anatomy of the testes more in just a few minutes here, but we're going to see these certain, uh, uh, seminiferous tubules have these Sertoli cells within them that in, uh, secrete inhibin. That will then feed back and have a stronger effect on inhibiting FSH. So testosterone, think more so inhibiting LH. <coughs> inhibin is going to be more focusing on the FSH. We'll see, okay. Again, looking at inhibin, those are secreted by the Sertoli cells. So imagine this is going to be your, um, uh, your testes. Imagine this is one of the seminiferous uh, tubules you're going to find within the testes itself. Uh, so again, this is just one particular uh, tubule you're going to find there. The Sertoli cells within them um, are going to be releasing inhibin that will then feed back. Because again, these uh, semin uh, seminiferous tubules are going to be responsible for producing the actual sperm themselves. So again, once they have enough sperm there, once they don't need to produce anymore, then that's when they can release that inhibin back and have a negative feedback loop on the system and, and try to shut down more uh, FSH and LH from being released. That makes sense, right? Okay. All right, so looking at the testes themselves, so again, you see kind of the cross section of the testes itself, you're going to find these two main uh, compartments here. So we're going to have the seminiferous tubules, which you can kind of see located right here. Uh, and then these are where you're going to find those Sertoli cells that are sp responsible for releasing inhibin. Um, and then you're also going to find the FSH is going to be what's uh, influencing spermatogenesis. Okay, you kind of see in this picture here, if you're looking at, uh, actually, this is a better picture to start with. So again, you see the seminiferous tubule. Notice here it has this kind of the lumen of that tubule where the sperm are going to be eventually released and travel uh, for eventual um, uh release, you're going to find that uh, you have these uh, spermatogenesis actually occurring here, and this is where they're going to be released from the um, uh, seminiferous tubules, right? Anyway, um, you're also going to have the interstitial tissue. So again, these cells are going to be kind of located in between the seminiferous tubules. This is where you actually have the lighting cells, and this is where the actual testosterone production is really happening here, okay? So kind of keep these two compartments kind of separated in your mind. Um, LH receptors are going to be found in those lytic cells, so it's going to be responding to that, which makes sense because we said testosterone mainly feeds back and inhibits LH more so than it does FSH. So that kind of makes sense uh, from that standpoint here. Okay. You can just uh, another kind of picture showing you a slide here where you have the seminiferous tubule. Again, here's the lumen itself where the sperm eventually are going to be released. You can kind of see them kind of getting kind of docked here around the side, and they can then eventually be released. Uh, and then you'll have the interstitial cells, and that's where you're finding those lytic cells that produce testosterone. Okay. Now, picture kind of showing the same thing. Here would be your lighting cells. Again, here you're going to find uh, the seminiferous tubule. All right, so spermatogenesis, we mentioned, is going to be occurring uh, within the seminiferous tubule the, and the Sertoli cells specifically. So you can kind of see this right here where it's actually going to be occurring. Um, during the maturation, you're actually finding that meiosis is going to be occurring here. And again, for every uh, round of meiosis, we're producing how many sperm, essentially? Four sperm, right? We're gonna see that's not the case for, for females, we'll see a little bit later on, but it should be producing four sperm uh, when you start out meiosis for these cells here. Um, basically, what you're gonna find is you have this uh, compaction of the chromatin, and we'll look at the, the anatomy of the sperm here in just a moment. Um, you can see like the nucleus is actually gonna change shape here. Um, you're gonna develop a flagellum, right? Remember what a flagellum is? It's like a whip like little tail that actually helps with the motility there. Again, that's like kind of the only human cell that actually produces a flagellum. Um, and then you're gonna have this acrosome we're gonna find is gonna be on the head of it. This is actually gonna have these digestive enzymes. Why do I think we need digestive enzymes on a on sperm? You guys ever seen that movie, Look Who's Talking? Right? <laughs> I always freaked me out as a kid when I saw it because I didn't really know what was going on. But anyway, again, the sperm have to get through into the actual egg itself. So we're going to find those are going to be useful uh, as far as the digestive enzymes go to actually get into it. Um, and again, the end result should be for sperm and hopefully not a baby that sounds like Bruce Willis, right? You guys are too, too young. 
All right, so again, looking at spermatogenesis itself, again, uh, normal mitosis will be occurring here in the spermatogonium, but when it's ready to actually develop the sperm itself, you're going to find you have uh, so, uh, its primary spermatocyte is going to undergo the first meiotic division. Remember here we have that doubling of the, um, uh, the, the DNA. We're going to have that crossing over that occurs there, allows for the genetic variation, uh, and then we're going to produce these spermatids here, right? So this will then uh, develop into the actual spermatozoa themselves. And again, each copy of the, or each uh, sperm is going to have how many copies of the DNA? Just one copy, right? So it's going to have one copy of everything, not the two that we normally need for a uh, usual sort of human cell, right? So looking at the actual anatomy of it itself here, you have the head. This is actually the condensed nucleus of the cell. So it all condensed down and actually formed the head of the sperm. Um, you're going to notice that the acrosome was formed from the Golgi apparatus. And this actually contains several um, lysosomal enzymes. So one of the primary ones you find is hyaluronidase. And it's good for breaking down things like connective tissues. This allows it to actually kind of burrow in and, and fuse with the egg, as we'll see later on. We also have the tail, uh, this axoneme, which is basically going to be this kind of central skeleton. These are the 11 microtubules, which you'll see here, and kind of form the rest of the tail. And then you'll also notice there's a lot of mitochondria here. Why do you think there's mitochondria in the sperm? It takes a lot of energy to get that motility going, right? So it can swim to uh, where it needs to go, right? And typical speed you're going to find is around one to four millimeters per minute. And again, this kind of depends on the, the environment that it's in. But in general, that's kind of the speed that you're going to be looking for. I mean, if anyone ever calls you a loser, just remember, you were one of millions of sperm that made it to that A. You guys are all winners in my book, okay? <laughs> At least once in your life you're a winner. But anywho, we're kind of going from these seminiferous tubules here where the actual sperm themselves are being produced, right? So then they end up getting released, and they're going to be end up being stored there in the testes as well. So we'll look to see um, that when the spermatids move from the seminiferous tubules, they're going to go to this, uh, these, I had to look this up, this reti testes, which you can kind of find here. Um, and I'm sorry, right, uh, right about here. And those are going to get stored uh, within the epididymis. Um, basically, this is where they get stored, is where they're going to have further maturation of the sperm itself. Um, again, they're going to be capable of motility at this point, so they're, they can be active, but they're going to be kind of kept in an inactive state. Because, again, these are in the storage space, and we're getting, waiting for release uh, eventually, right? Um, they can be stored up for at least a month. Um, once sperm are actually out into the open at room temperature, they may only last for about 24 to 48 hours or so. However, when they're, um, say, in the female reproductive tract, they can actually last up to five days, right? Right? So again, just because, um, you know, does conception happen right at the time of coitus? No, it can happen several days afterwards because the sperm remain active uh, for several days afterwards. And then you still see that implantation actually occur there. And people are, uh, males are roughly producing around 120 million sperm uh, made per day. Okay, um, so some other um, accessory organs we're going to see here. So again, we said the uh, sperm are going to be producing the testes. They get stored here in the epididymis. Um, during ejaculation, you're going to find that they're moving from the epididymis. They're moving through the vast deferens here, kind of rope around the bladder. And you're going to find they go through the, the ejaculatory duct, which you can find right here. And again, you're going to see that the prostate is going to be involved here as well. And again, the prostate is going to be responsible for several secretions that are going to be uh, helping to make up the actual ejaculate itself. We'll look at that content in just a few minutes. Um, and then it can actually get exit through the urethra and into a re female reproductive tract and then potentially uh, um, cause pregnancy to occur. So looking at the semen itself, you know, roughly only about 2 to 5% of it is actually going to be the actual spermatozoa itself. So again, relatively small content is going to be the actual sperm. Uh, a lot of the rest of it is going to be the seminal fluid, around 60 to 75% uh, here. Um, one thing it's going to contain is a lot of fructose. So there's a specific sugar that's going to be needed for the sperm to actually produce energy, as we'll see. Um, we'll also have some other things like fibrinogen and prostaglandins. What do you think fibrinogen is used for? What do we normally use fibrinogen for? Produce, yeah, for clotting, which produces fiber. What does that cause? It's a kind of sticky web that's going to allow like things to stay in place. We're going to see that's actually going to be useful for the sperm here in just a little bit as well. Prostaglandin is also going to be useful here. Uh, the prostate is going to be secreting some fluid as well. So things like citric acid, uh, zinc, calcium, some coagulation proteins, pro profibrinolysin. So yeah, that will also be important in a few minutes as well when we're talking about um, kind of what occurs after we actually have contact with the female reproductive tract. Um, then also some galactose and mucus. Again, these are also used to, to increase sperm motility here. So again, several different factors here. Things to know, I would probably say, is that, yes, um, you know, fructose is really needed for the energy production uh, for the sperm, so that way they can remain uh, uh, the motility. We're also going to look at some of these clotting factors here. They're going to be useful in just a few minutes. Okay, so again, uh, looking at actual uh, erection itself, so there's going to be several components we actually need uh, when uh, developing an erection, so they're going to be sort of a vascular component. When I say that, what does that really mean? Got to have blood supply, right? Got to have good blood flow. Um, we're going to see there's going to be a nerve component here. There's actually going to be both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system are going to be involved here in the actual uh, developing of an erection and eventual ejaculation. Um, there's going to be a psychological component, right? What does that mean? 
some sort of external stimuli is actually uh, stimulating the, <laughs> the urge to develop an erection in the first place. And then we're also going to see there's a hormonal component as well. So testosterone is going to be the main thing there. Now, keep in mind, when you're dealing with someone who's had, and again, if you cannot develop an erection, what do you call that? Erectile dysfunction, right? So again, if you have a patient who's developing erectile dysfunction, you need to look at some of these components here to see, well, is it a blood flow issue? Is it a nervous system issue? Is it a psychological component? You know, it could be depression they're dealing with or um, the effects of, you know, drugs and alcohol. Uh, and then also look at the hormonal component, right? Because again, you have four different things you could be targeting depending on what the patient's actually experiencing. And again, it'd be easy enough just to say, well, let's just give Viagra to everybody, but that may not be appropriate for those patients as the case may be, right? Anyone know what, which uh, aspect Viagra affects? talked about it before yeah. yeah the blood supply right it's gonna be affecting because remember we talked about it affecting uh, cyclic gmp cause smooth muscle relaxation lots of vasodilation and lots more blood flow to occur again i won't touch you on that specifically but just know um that again one issue of this uh could be playing a role it could be multiple problems with your patient depending on what's going on Okay, so again, basically what you're going to find is that the erection actually occurs here when you have blood flow into the erectile tissues of the penis. So again, the corpus cavernosa, you can see these two uh, located right here. And basically what you're going to find is that you want to cause um, basically uh, more blood flow to be coming in than coming out. And that way you can help to uh, sustain that erection there. Now, the parasympathetic nerve uh, is going to be providing nitric oxide. Do you remember what nitric oxide does for us? Cause of vasodilation typically. So you're going to cause vasodilation of these arterioles, leading for basically uh, these blood vessels to dilate, with a lot more blood flow to be coming in and heading out at that point, right? Even if you're looking at this, um, say you have nitric oxide being released here, say from this cavernous nerve, so some sort of sexual stimulation is coming from the CNS down, um, stimulating nitric oxide to be produced. Again, it's going to be activating guanylyl cyclase, which then produces what? Cyclic GMP or as a guanylyl cyclase, just like a dimylyl cyclase, so it produces CGMP. And that can then cause uh, this uh, release. Um, a blocking of calcium from coming in, and that will cause vasodilation to occur. Because less calcium, less smooth muscle uh, uh, constrictions are going to be happening there, and so you see that relaxation. Um, and again, remember <coughs> with things like phosphodiesterase inhibitors like Viagra can actually interrupt the system and cause uh, more CGMP to be produced and cause more vasodilation. So again, if the blood flow is an issue, that's why things like Viagra can be useful for that. Okay, so uh, emission itself is the actual movement of semen uh, into the urethra, and so we're going to find that the the ejaculate um, ejaculation is that, that forceful expulsion of the semen from the urethra here. And again, both of these are going to be under um, the sympathetic nervous system control, and it's going to be maintained through that pudendal nerve. Remember where else we saw the pudendal nerve? That yeah, control of uh, micturition, right? So we saw that it's going to be responsible for innervating that external um, urethral sphincter. Again, we're going to see it's going to be helping with the sympathetic nervous system uh, to help with ejaculation. Basically, what you're going to find is you're going to have contraction of the smooth muscles in those tubules. Um, and again, it has to be kind of a coordinated effect to make sure we're kind of forcing things um, you know, through peristalsis in the right direction there, right? And again, basically, you're going to have a, a smooth muscle contraction of the tubules, the seminal vesicle, the prostate, everything kind of contracts uh, at the same time in concert in order to allow uh, for the actual ejaculation to occur there. Okay, so again, looking at the actual um, semen analysis, it can be useful if you're, say, working on like reproductive endocrinology, if you're working with these type of patients who are maybe having issues um, getting pregnant. Um, you can look at things like the volume of the ejaculate itself, you know, the actual sperm counts. Maybe there's an issue where they're not producing enough um, sperm on their own, which could be a result of problems like, say, LH and FSH, you know. Um, then you also can look at things like motility, and sometimes they'll actually look at the percentage that remains motile after a certain period of time, you know. So again, if they're kind of um, becoming less motile, uh, for a shorter period of time, maybe they're not going to be really effective at uh, kind of meeting up with the egg in their female reproductive tract, as the case may be. Um, other things you can look at is like fructose concentration. Obviously, you had too low a fructose, what could happen? Not yeah, it may not be modal, right? Because again, they're going to be, they don't have any energy. Just like uh, some of you guys need like the, uh, your energy drinks and things like that to get through the day, uh, sperm need that fructose in order to make sure you can get through the reproductive tract and infuse with that ova. Okay. So, any questions on that specifically? Let's go ahead and do a 10 minute break and we'll come back and then continue on. <laughs> so okay, any questions on uh, any stuff we covered in the first half? All right, so now we're moving on to the female reproductive organs. So uh, the two main things we're talking about here are going to be the ovaries itself, which again, these are where the, uh, the female gonads themselves is where we have uh, sex steroid production. We said for females, it's going to be mainly what? Estrogen and. Progesterone, good. Uh, you're going to find the estrogen is kind of a um, sort of a umbrella sort of term. There's several different types of estrogen-based uh, hormones that females will produce, but we'll talk about those. And then um, also this is where the actual oocyte storage is going to be happening there, as you'll see a little bit later on. Um, next, you have the the fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes. Again, you find the ovaries here. Um, once we're going to find that as the eggs get released and they're ready for fertilization and implantation, they're going to be traveling from the fallopian tubes and they head, head to 
the uterus. Not a uterus, but it's a uterus, right? That's, that's a really bad one. Anywho, so we're going to be looking at that. Um, we'll look at the, the menstrual cycle in more detail. Um, but um, again, the uterus is the actual site of the embryonic development, so our actual uh, potential babies will be producing there. A um, couple of different layers here. We're going to have the endometrium, which is going to be the innermost layer. That's actually where the embryo is going to be implanting and actually developing. And the myometrium, which is kind of this middle muscle layer that actually contracts during uh, birthing. Remember what stimulates that contraction? Remember oxytocin is one of them. Remember that positive feedback loop we talked about? So oxytocin is good for that. And then we're going to have this perimetrium, which is going to be this kind of outer connective tissue layer. And then finally, the cervix is basically going to be this narrow bottom region of the uterus itself. Again, when the baby's coming out, that's where it's going to be coming out through, essentially. right? And that's where it's going to be coming in to cause the actual uh, fertilization to occur. All right. Um, so looking at the, the chemistry here, so again, we're talking estrogens and progestins. Remember that uh, most uh, hormones... Well, steroids are going to be starting off with cholesterol, right? We mentioned cholesterol being uh, an important thing that gets uh, produced in the, in the liver, gets transported throughout the body. This is one of its uses. And so there's a lot of different um, components going to get turned into. One of the big things is progesterone, as we're going to see here just a little bit. Um, and again, notice here this kind of interconversion between various estrogens and, and testosterone. So you start out with this interesting dione that itself can be converted via the enzyme aromatase into estrone. And then also we have testosterone getting converted via aromatase into estradiol. Estradiol is going to be one of the main um, ones we're going to see working specifically in the female reproductive tract. However, you're also going to have this estrone and this estriol, but probably estradiol is going to be the more common one you're going to run into as far as like which one gets produced in the highest amounts. So est estradiol is really important here. Um, and again, imagine um, when we get into talking about things like menopause and talking about um, like different treatments for things like breast cancer and things like that, this is one of the main systems we're going to be affecting here. And again, it's important to understand if you change one of these systems, like what kind of effects would you expect to see? So for instance, imagine I had someone who had, say, breast cancer and it was estrogen uh, uh, sensitive breast cancer, I meaning the more estrogen they have around, the more that breast tissue is going to be developing, the cancerous tissue is going to be developing, the more likely the patient is going to succumb to that, right, eventually. So one of the ways I can actually prevent that from occurring, I can prevent that effect of estrogens by doing what, do you think? Well, if I inhibit the production, I can inhibit aromatase, right? And so again, I can prevent this conversion of testosterone into uh, estradiol. Now, I have less estrogen to interact with those cancer cells, right? Seems like it's a good way to fix the problem. What side effect do you think you might expect to see from that? What type of side effects? Because obviously, if I block conversion of testosterone into estradiol, now I have all this extra testosterone around. What do you might, what did you expect to see? Um, yeah, yeah this masculinizing sort of effects you would see in these female patients, right? So again, these are the kind of things that I want you to kind of key in on now, because we're going to see as disease states will change these, or as we get changes based on our treatment, what kind of effects you would expect to see, both good and bad. In these cases, you can see things like abnormal hair growth. Anyone know what else that's termed as? Or known as? Hirsutism, that's a big thing you can find with things where you have like too much testosterone effect. Um, they can have like a deepening of their voice and lots of other kind of masculinizing sort of effects. That uh, is that usually preferred by females? Often not, right? So again, this is one of the big problems you run into, and that's why this is like not a great way to treat this. However, it's been very effective. You may need it for really treatment uh, resistance sort of breast cancer. Anyway, uh, that aside. You're gonna find the primary things we're producing here is gonna be estrogen. These are gonna be secreted uh, primarily by the ovaries. And again, this is primarily in non-pregnant females. We're gonna see this changes uh, when you get into pregnant females. Um, small amount of, uh, amount of it's gonna be coming from the adrenal cortex, but primarily the ovaries are the big place you're gonna see uh, estrogen produced. And again, estradiol being the main one we're gonna see there. Uh, progesterone is gonna be made by the corpus luteum. And we're gonna see this is uh, gonna be present in the latter half of the ovarian cycle. So we'll look at that in a few minutes here. And again, these are metabolized through the liver. They can be excreted out through the bile. And there's a little bit of that. Remember we talked about enterohepatic recirculation. This is one of those um, uh, steroids that actually goes to enterohepatic recirculation keep levels up higher for longer because as they get spit out into the GI tract you uh, then have bacteria break it down and then you reabsorb it and keep the levels up for longer. Anyway. So looking at um, kind of the early periods imagine kind of birth to 20 months of, of infancy here for these uh, females you're going to find that you know LH and FSH will be kind of stimulated at first but then should drop down to near uh, uh, zero levels as we saw with, like our male patients and then when you notice it starts to spike up again Puberty, perfect. So again, around puberty, it's going to start to spike up again. And then you're going to notice here this kind of nice uh, vacillation that happens. And what is this? This is our menstrual cycle, as we're going to see in a little bit, right? So again, this is going to be uh, our, the ovarian cycle we're going to be looking at. Uh, and then you're going to notice here, towards the end, where it said menopause. Why, why do you think LH and FSH now are climbing back up? We said menopause, there's patients producing less what? Less estrogen. So why would my LH and FSH go back up? Yeah, there's nothing to inhibit it, right? Remember, we're going to talk about negative feedback loops. Just like if you were to say, for instance, if you were to uh, you know, castrate a male patient, not that I'm 
saying you should do that, but imagine you had, um, what's his name, Barris from uh, Game of Thrones, right? He was, he was castrated. Um, what would you expect his LH and FSH levels to be? Elevated, low? Probably elevated, right? Because, again, he doesn't have any uh, testosterone to inhibit to feedback and actually inhibit that, right? You guys are definitely in the right age range for Game of Thrones, so you at least know that reference, right? Maybe the Unsullied. Maybe I can talk about them. But anyway, I need Professor Gert here to back me up. But um, you would expect those patients, you know, if you don't have uh, the negative feedback loop in place, and if you're missing those hormones, you're going to find that you're going to have the LH and FSH typically be high. So for those patients, you know, just like we saw, if you have an under-functioning thyroid, what's your TSH level look like? High, low? If you're not producing thyroxin, it should be high, right? Because, again, it doesn't matter how much you try to stimulate that organ. If it's not actually producing the hormones you're looking for, it's never going to feed back and, and, and lower those levels. All right. Anyway, so again, it all kind of goes back to the same concept there, that negative feedback loop. But um, again, once we see puberty starting to in, this, uh, kick in, this is where we're going to see things like growth spurts, breast development, as we have menarch, or the, the first menstrual flow that happens here. And then um, body hair is going to be stimulated. And again, here you're going to see androgens are so important because these will stimulate uh, the body hair growth. Um, and again, this is mainly coming from that adrenal gland there, right from the cortex. Again, uh, I'm not going to have you like memorize specific ages here by any means, but again, look at the uh, the hormones that are involved with this and kind of see what effects you should expect to see from uh, them being upregulated. So again, looking at things like breast tissue development, this is mainly going to be things like estrogen and progesterone are going to help out with this. Um, certainly the adrenal androgens, so things like testosterone and, and DHT to some small amount, are going to be helping to develop things like pubic hair, um, you know, the axillary underarm hair, uh, sweat glands, things like that. Um, and the first menstrual flow is going to be mainly uh, stimulated by estrogen and progesterone, as we'll see in just a little bit. Okay. All right. So looking at the negative feedback loop, so the hypothalamus should be secreting GnRH, just like so again, most of this is going to be the same as the male patient until you get down to the actual um, uh, sex organ itself. But GnRH is going to be released from uh, the hypothalamus, which then stimulates uh, the anterior pituitary to release what? LFSH and LH, good. So again, this is going to be secreting that, and it's going to get down into the actual um, ovaries themselves. And then you're going to find um, that from here, you're going to have estrogen produced, you're going to have progesterone produced, and then also inhibin is going to be producing here as well, right? So remember that inhibin mainly uh, feeds back to inhibit what? Just like we saw with male patients. FSH, yeah, so again, that's going to be important because, again, follicle-stimulating hormone, we're going to see that typically when you have, um, when we're going through the menstrual cycle, how many follicles do you typically want developed and released at one time? Just one, right? So again, we're going to find that you want to make sure that you only have that one that actually gets produced um, and, and try to inhibit all the other ones. So again, follicle stimulating hormone, that's what it does. So we're going to see the inhibition is going to be useful there as well. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes, okay? Okay, so looking at the actual uh, ovaries themselves. So again, this is the typical cycle you're going to be kind of running into. So we're going to look at this from a sort of clockwise sort of uh, fashion here. Basically, we're going to find is ovarian follicle is going to be the one that actually uh, stimulates secretion of estradiol, okay? So as the follicle starts to develop, usually in response to LH and FSH, you're going to find that the follicle develops, so it's going to start to produce estradiol. And then eventually, once you actually release the egg itself, and we're going to go more into detail on this, but you're actually going to have this corpus luteum left behind, and this corpus luteum is basically what's producing progesterone. So again, typically, if you were to look at the menstrual cycle, you can kind of divide this in half, basically, where ovulation kind of happens right at the midpoint. You're going to have mainly estrogen being produced early on, and then you're going to have estrogen and progesterone that are going to be produced later on uh, in the second half, based on the corpus luteum here, okay? And you're also going to have these granulosa cells of the ovarian follicles, and you can see these uh, granulosa cells be kind of generated here in the follicle. This is what is secreting inhibin, and remember, it's going to feed back and actually inhibit the release of FSH. Really shouldn't affect LH in that case, but FSH is the main thing it's uh, inhibiting, right? Which makes sense because as you have this one follicle start to develop here, you kind of want to shut down all the other follicles from, from trying to develop, right? Because you only want the one. Um, so that's where the inhibin is going to be really useful here from the, uh, those granulosa cells. Okay, so let's talk about the menstrual cycle. That's a very funny picture. Anyway, so how long is a menstrual cycle? 28 days typically, right? And so again, these are good graphs to kind of go back and you can see all the different um, uh, effects that are occurring here. So again, this is mainly going to be the ovarian cycle we're going to talk about. And this is happening at the same time we're having the actual uterine cycle. And you can notice here on either end, bookending here is actually the menstruation itself. And when we have menstruation, what's happening? If you're, you're sloughing off the, the endometrium that's been developing all month, all right? So again, um, it's kind of a gross word. Isn't it? <laughs> slough. Slowing, so I don't know how to pronounce it specifically. I always say slough. It sounds grosser that way. But anyway, um, so again, these two cycles are going to be happening in tandem here. So they're going to be happening at the same time. We're going to see that um, typically the ovarian cycle is going to be stimulating uh, the, the uterine cycle, right? So again, the uterine cycle is basically going to kind of be following the lead of what's happening in the ovarian cycle here, right? And again, keep in mind the uh, hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary are going to be playing the big roles here as well, kind of dictating uh, things, okay? 
detail on this. Um, these graphs are also very nice to look at the secretion of the different hormones throughout the menstrual cycle, right? So again, you're starting off, um, say, the 28-day the cycle here. Notice ovulation typically happens around day 14 or so, right? So kind of the midpoint of that 28-day cycle. And again, does it always 28 days? No, it can go longer, it can go shorter. You're going to find that uh, there's some variability there, but let's just say for our purposes on average, around 28 days. Ovulation is usually going to be right at, at day 14. What is ovulation, though? Do we say what that was? This would be actually the egg itself being released, getting ready for, for fertilization, right? So again, before then, you don't really have any eggs available for uh, implantation, but during ovulation, that's when it, that occurs. Um, so anyway, so again, before this, you're going to find uh, that these various hormone levels are going to be kind of directing the, the growth and development of both the ovaries and also of the, the endometrium, as we'll see. And so basically what you're going to find is that early on, you're going to have estradiol levels are going to be up higher. Um, uh, progesterone levels, you're going to notice are going to be relatively low. And that's because we're going to see that the corpus luteum actually doesn't get developed until the second half here. And again, we're going to get more into detail on this in just a moment. But uh, the other big thing is looking at the FSH and the LH. And again, notice here, that this is what's actually stimulating the ovulation itself. We call this the LH surge, what we're going to talk about in a moment. But anyway, I said, you know, average of 28 days, we should be releasing just a single ovum that gets released from his ovaries, and that's the actual ovulation itself. It's going to travel through the fallopian tubes, hopefully to get implanted with a sperm, and then you can actually have implantation in the uterus itself to develop uh, an embryo. Um, and that uterine endometrium has to be kind of prepared in advance. So you're going to find there's usually a development of that tissue, kind of getting more vascular, kind of getting hypertrophied, getting it ready. And then if no implantation happens, what happens? You just get rid of it all, right? So it says, okay, well, we didn't have any implantation happen this time. We'll try again next month. Let's go ahead and get rid of it. And that's when you have the actual menstruation occur, right? So primary hormones are going to be the GNRH, LH, FSH, and then finally estrogen, progesterone. Yes, sir. Did you say that the corpus luteum mainly dictates progesterone or is it... Estrogen and progesterone. You're going to find both gets uh, sent out by the corpus luteum, but progesterone is going to be the big one, right? So can you still see the estrogen levels are still higher than you would be, say, at baseline, but they're not going to be as high as it would have been right at the early uh, phases here, okay? We'll look at why that is in a moment. Okay, so looking at this, we're going to look at the primary uh, oocytes, right? So again, imagine you have oogenesis here. You're going to have these primordial sort of germ cells. Um, again, by looking at this development, you're going to find it develops into these uh, kind of primordial sort of follicles here. Now, remember, um, during meiosis, how many active eggs do you get from that, 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 those two stages of meiosis? You only get one. Remember what happens to the other three? Yeah, we're going to see those actually get converted into what we call polar bodies. Basically, these are going to be uh, just uh, discarded. They're not going to be actually active uh, ovas themselves. And you kind of see that process here where you have actual meiosis one happening. Notice here you get this kind of first polar body that uh, degenerates. Basically, it was not chosen as the, the chosen uh, ova to develop. And then as you go through this uh, second period here, you're going to find that you have another polar body degeneration here additionally. Okay. Anyway, so again, you get three polar bodies uh, for every one egg that you have developed in, in this case, okay? Um, typically, the ovaries of a newborn girl, around 2 million uh, primary oocytes, all those get used during her whole lifetime? Probably not, right? By the time puberty hits, it's cut down to about 400,000, and then maybe only about 400 of those will be ovulated in her lifetime. So again, you should have a excess uh, or surplus of eggs, um, but you may only use about 400 of them in a given lifespan, right? Okay, so uh, we'll see that the primary oocytes are going to be contained within the, the primary follicles. And then as you have things like FSH start to develop, again, follicle stimulating hormone, it makes sense that it will stimulate the follicles, right? You're going to find that some of the primary follicles are going to start to grow. Again, not just one, but multiples will start to try to develop, and they're going to try to uh, beat each other out. It's kind of a competition going on there. And they're going to produce these granulosa cells, right? So again, roughly get about 6 to 12 to get stimulated per month. And again, ideally, we only have one that actually gets matured. All the other ones go atresia, right? What does that mean? It's going to die off, right? So they, can, they, they become underdeveloped because, again, we said those granulosa cells are releasing what? Inhibin, which feeds back and inhibits follicle stimulating hormone, right? So, again, once you have one that kind of takes uh, takes the lead, it will then start to produce that inhibin that will feed back and it kind of prevents a further development of those other follicles. So, ideally, you should only get one over that's going to be mature there, right? Again, the other ones may uh, develop into kind of fluid filled vesicles called secondary follicles. Um, but again, you should really just have the one that becomes fully mature. Okay. Again, looking at this oogenesis, again, you see the, the polar bodies are actually going to be developed here. Again, you just have the one ovum that's going to be uh, turning into a mature egg itself. And again, when you're going to be looking here, see how it turns into primary, um, uh, a primordial follicle, I should say. This one is actually going kind of counterclockwise, so it's a little different than the last one we looked at. But you should see a primary follicle develop. As those follicles start to develop, you're going to develop what we call this uh, graphene follicle. And again, this is what's going to be getting ready for actual release of the egg itself. So again, this is the actual ovulation uh, period. We'll go into more detail on this. 
Okay, so again, after ovulation, you're going to have a remaining follicle that is left over. So again, once you release this egg here, you develop what's called the corpus luteum. It's basically just the remainders of this, uh, this primary follicle that actually release the egg itself. So the corpus luteum, this is important because it's going to be releasing estradiol and then progesterone. Okay, um, again, these are going to be helping to regulate things like the, the uterine cycle um, and getting things ready for uh, normal menstrual cycles, as we'll see just in a few minutes here. Okay. Okay, so looking at this, you can find that you can break down um, the follicular changes that occur into three phases here. So you have the follicular phase, you're going to have the ovulation and the actual luteal phase itself. So again, looking at development here, you're going to have the developing follicle uh, turn into this big graphene follicle. That's kind of the mature egg that's going to develop. Ovulation is when it actually releases the ova itself, and then this will convert over into the luteal phase in, in the cor corpus luteum. And eventually you'll have this kind of albicans body that's kind of left over uh, when getting prepared for the next cycle. Uh, the follicular phase should be lasting you know, one to about 13 days or so. And again, this is variable depending on how long the actual menstrual cycle is. But it should go from kind of a primary follicle to secondary to this graphene follicle. This is what is ready for actual release of the egg during ovulation itself. Okay. What you find is granulosa cells, not only are they producing uh, inhibin, but they're also producing estradiol itself. And you look back at that graph, you'll see that early on in the first half of the month, you're going to find the estrogen level should be uh, climbing. Uh, and that's going to be due to that primary follicle developing, and you're going to get that basically, um, uh, the granulosa cells releasing that. You can kind of see that looking at the estradiol levels here. This is basically from that graphene follicle and those granulosa cells releasing estradiol. You notice progesterone levels stay pretty low for the, the first half of the month here, as you'll see. Okay. So again, the follicular phase is going to be initiated by FSH primarily. So you can kind of see those levels will start to peak up early on. So the green line here is going to be uh, the actual FSH. The uh, blue line is uh, LH. But the green line will kind of pick up here initially, and that's what's going to be stimulating the follicle development. And it will stimulate estradiol production, which you see here towards um, the ovulation period. Okay. Again, the end of this phase, you're going to find that having uh, the FSH around having the high levels of estradiol will actually help to stimulate production of LH receptors on the graphene follicle. Okay, so again, what you're going to find is that estradiol will actually help to upregulate the number of LH uh, receptors that are available on the graphene follicle. Okay, that means it's going to be more or less sensitive to LH. It's more sensitive, right? There's more receptors for it to interact with, right? So it's going to become more sensitive here to LH. So then at that point, you're going to find that uh, having an increased amount of estradiol will actually stimulate the hypothalamus. And it seems kind of counterintuitive because you normally think estradiol would feed back and actually inhibit it. In this case, you actually have a little bit of stimulation that occurs here. And so basically, it's going to tell the hypothalamus to release more GnRH. And it's going to actually help to increase the release of luteinizing hormone. Okay. And you can see that right here. You notice this big spike because the LH surge. So basically, this uh, follicle is developing, it's releasing estradiol, those levels are climbing, and then now you have the luteinizing hormone surge here, right? It's LH surge, it's going to peak up, it's going to interact with all those receptors that are now been upregulated on that, on that graphene follicle, and that's what's actually going to stimulate the actual ovulation itself. Okay? Make sense so far? Okay, so again, the LH surge causes the ovulation, so the graphene follicle will then rupture, releasing the oocyte, and the oocyte can then travel through the fallopian tubes and eventually for um, uh, implantation and um, uh, fertilization and implantation in the actual uterus itself. Um, next up, we're going to talk about the, the luteal phase here, and again, this is where we're going to see the corpus luteum actually producing a lot of estrogen and progesterone on its own. Okay, um, so the corpus luteum secretes the estradiol and progesterone. You see those levels start to peak up here towards the second end of the month. And again, if, um, and I kind of equate this back when I'm looking at like oral contraceptives, I'm looking at birth control. You'll see that a lot of times the birth controls are designed to actually replicate the system pretty pretty well, right? So you can find there's actually changing doses of estrogen and progesterone in each of those. So that way you kind of mimic the cycle uh, pretty pretty similarly. So again, you may find certain estrogen levels at the beginning of the month and they may actually peak up the progesterone in the second half of the month because that is what a normal cycle looks like for a woman anyway, right? Anyway, corpus luteum, as I mentioned, estradiol and progesterone, and then basically this is going to peak about one week after ovulation. So kind of in the third uh, quarter of the cycle there, that's when you should see mostly progesterone and estrogen uh, being in there. Uh, progesterone definitely being in the highest levels there. Okay. And again, what we're going to see here is that the estrogens themselves are going to have uh, a stimulatory sort of effect on the, the uterine tissue, and you're definitely going to see that with progesterone and estrogen. Notice here, things are getting more vascular, the tissue starting to hypertrophy. This is getting the uterus ready for what? Implantation, good, right? So that's what, that's what we're looking for there. So, um, again, the luteal phase, uh, high levels, basically how we kind of shut down the whole thing uh, in the end, is going to be that with those high levels of estradiol and progesterone that are being released um, from the corpus luteum, that's going to then feed back to the hypothalamus, <laughs> it's going to feed back to uh, the anterior pituitary, and then shut down LH and FSH production, okay? And again, if you look back at those graphs, you'll see the LH and FSH then drop down pretty low once you have progesterone and estrogen starting to really get upregulated by that corpus luteum. Okay. 
And again, inhibin is only going to feed back and inhibit uh, FSH only. You can kind of see that in this picture here. We actually have the, um, the ovulation occur. The corpus luteum is going to feed back and inhibit this system. Just remember that early on, you're going to have um, this phase here. We actually have the high estrogen level will actually stimulate release of LH, and that's what actually causes the ovulation to actually occur. Okay, so just remember that fact. That fact. Okay, so let's see ovarian sort of cycle there. Let's look at the uterine cycle and the uterine development here, right? The endometrium is the main thing we're focused on, um, and so we're going to see that it follows the changes seen in, in actual follicles itself, okay? So again, typically this is going to be following the different effects of these um, uh, that you're going to see with the, actual, the ovaries themselves. So again, as estrogen starts to upregulate in the first half, and as progesterone starts to upregulate in the second half, the, the uterine tissue is going to be responding to that. So... Again, when we're talking about the actual menstrual uterine cycle, this is the 28-day cycle we're talking about. We actually have building up of the tissue, and then you get rid of it towards the end if no implantations actually occur there, right? Um, basically, we're going to say the first day of the menstrual cycle is the first day of menses. And so you kind of use that as uh, for um, general terminology. That's the first day of actual uh, menses itself. This will follow the three phases, so the menstrual, proliferative, and the secretory phase. So keep this in mind. This is working in tandem with the ovarian uh, cycle that's happening here. But again, this is typically following the lead of the ovarian uh, cycle. Okay, so uh, menstrual cycle begins with menstruation, as you would imagine. So again, you're getting rid of that tissue that has now developed because no implantation has actually occurred. Um, and again, this is going to be regulated specifically by the estradiol and progesterone levels. Okay. You can kind of see here in this graph how as uh, estrogen and progesterone levels develop, notice here how this is getting more vascular, it's getting more uh, tissue getting built up, and then right towards the end, if nothing's happened, then you're going to have uh, this menstrual phase itself actually occur. And this is always going to be day one of the cycle here. Okay, so the proliferative phase itself, which you can see here happening, say, uh, day 7 to 14 of the cycle, is going to be occurring uh, basically when the ovary is still in the follicular phase, right? So the proliferative phase in the uterus is still happening during the follicular phase in the ovaries. And you're going to find that the estrogen levels, as they're growing, uh, are going to be actually stimulating growth of the endometrium itself, okay? And then you're going to find it gets more vascular, and you're also going to find this upregulation of progesterone receptors. It actually gets, becomes more sensitive to progesterone as those levels start to build up. Okay, so uh, the secretory phase though, is going to occur when the ovaries are going to be in the luteal phase, right? So again, they've released the egg, ovulation's occurred, and now you have that corpus luteum secreting progesterone and estrogen. And so this secretion of progesterone actually will stimulate the endometrium to become even thicker, even more vascular, ready, getting it ready for that implantation to occur there, okay? Again, uh, if the fertilization occurs there, it is very, uh, it's got a lot of blood flow, it's got a lot of nutrients heading to it, it's very ready uh, for that to occur to help uh, the developing uh, fetus. And so during the menstrual phase itself, though, imagine uh, if you had no implantation actually occur there, what you see is that the levels of estrogen and progesterone are going to start to drop down, right? So again, this occurs because um, when you have estrogen and progesterone, those levels start to pick up. What does that feedback and inhibit? Yeah, FSH and LH, right? So basically by having those high levels, it's going to feedback, shut down the system. And again, if nothing has happened, what you're going to find is that you're going to have things like the arteries of the endometrium, they actually start to constrict. And when you start to constrict that blood flow, what does that do to that tissue? Starts it off of uh, oxygen and nutrients, and guess what? It's going to die off, and that's when you have the actual uh, menstrual phase actually occur there. Okay. Okay. So again, you kind of break down the phases here. Remember to keep the the ovarian phases and the uterine phases separate in your mind, but just know that the ovarian phases are usually going to be dictating what happens in, in the uh, endometrium as far as development and eventual um, uh, sloughing off of the tissue there uh, during the menstrual phase. Okay. And again, this kind of makes um, some sense, especially when you're looking at things like birth control. And I always go back to that example because that's kind of our primary way of actually affecting the menstrual cycle. Um, but when females go on oral contraceptives, do they still have a period? They do, right? So again, and, and why does that actually occur? Because again, they're taking estrogen and progestins, but one of the important set of pills that they're taking for a week long is what? They're actually placebo pills, right? So actually, why do they put placebo pills in there? Yeah, so that we actually used to taking pills every single day because if I had to go, say, take the pills for three weeks and then stop for a week and then remember to restart again, that would be tougher than if I was just taking the same pill every single day roughly, right? So, um, but do they have to have a period? Do I have to have that withdrawal that actually occurs here? No, there's some actual dosage formulations that allow for, say, three or four periods per, uh, per year. So I can actually get an active drug throughout that whole period and then, uh, say, they're getting estrogen and progestin every single day. And say, if they only want one period a year, guess what? I can do that. I can just give them the hormones all the way throughout. And then as I... Uh, had that week of placebo, basically that withdrawal of estrogen and progestin causes that tissue to finally slough off and they have their, their menstrual cycle, right? But again, we can very easily kind of manage this and actually change the cycle itself based on the, the hormones that we're giving to these patients, right? Make sense? That's why you say like season E can season now. 
uh, or the two um, big ones I've seen most frequently to help to kind of uh, have less periods throughout the year, which can be good for some patients, especially that have really bad uh, menstrual pains and, and things like that. So that exogenous estrogen causes the endometrium to like continue building as if it were as if the female were pregnant? Um, not as if she was pregnant. So, again, we're basically giving them um, super therapeutic levels, right? So we're giving them uh, bigger levels than what their body would actually produce on its own to shut down the whole system, right? So it shuts down the LH and FSH. So basically, they never ovulate. They never have that stimulation of the follicle. So that's basically what you see there, right? Now, if I were to just give them estrogen, you'd still get that stimulatory effect on the endometrium, and that could actually lead to cancer in some cases, right? They still have an intact uterus. But by giving them progesterone along with it, it kind of keeps it in check, so to speak. Yes, ma'am? Oh, perfect. Great. I'll do it when I can do that. Yes, ma'am. So if, if they're given, if they're being given a, like a level throughout the month, why is there like times when there's like earlier periods in between like Um, in so much as like spotting early or. Yeah, so some of that can, and again, we'll talk about this when we get to like uh, women's health section in, in farm two, I think. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. And basically, sometimes it can be related to having too low estrogen levels, too high estrogen levels, and actually it can depend on when they're actually having the bleeding. And you can kind of diagnose that and try to determine, do I need to increase the dose in the early part of the, the cycle? Or do I need to change it elsewhere? Um, so again, it's kind of outside of our scope here, but it's kind of interesting. And again, I thought this was black magic when I was like, you can change the menstrual cycle? I was like, what? Has <laughs> ever heard of honeymooning? Or basically, you can give them active drug um, throughout the whole period. So, again, if they have, like, an event they want to go to, like, I don't know, their honeymoon, and they don't want to be on their period, they can take active drug the whole period, and then when they come back, then they can have the placebo pills. I, would, I know. I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this stuff is fascinating. You can, like, modify, you know, the hormones and, and, and have such a big effect here. But um, anywho, so any questions on that so far? Okay. You can I barely have an understanding of how women work. Uh, this is probably the extent of it. Uh, as far as from an emotional standpoint, I'm definitely clueless. So don't ask me about that. Okay. So just remember, early on, you're going to have uh, FSH stimulating the follicle production. That's also going to help to um, start estradiol production within those primary follicles, right? Uh, and then, uh, sorry, the granulosa cells are going to start to produce estradiol. That's then going to cause LH receptors to become more uh, uh, present on those, that graphene follicle. Then we have the LH surge, that's what's going to cause the ovulation to occur, and then the corpus luteum to develop, which produces estrogen and progesterone. Okay, so progesterone really doesn't pick up until the second phase of the cycle here towards the end, uh, the latter half of it. Okay, remember how the endometrium is going to be developing, and then when you have that sudden withdrawal of hormones is when you're actually going to have the actual menstrual phase. You're going to get rid of that tissue and get ready for a whole new cycle all over again. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned contraceptives. So basically, we're um, generally including estrogen and progesterone together, and it kind of acts like a really prolonged luteal phase, right? So it's kind of like the body's already had that uh, that uh, ovulation occur. However, we never gave it the FSH to actually stimulate that follicle in the first place. So the idea is you stimulate or extend that luteal phase. You never have an actual ovulation occur, and that hopefully will prevent pregnancy from happening, right? So you get that negative feedback loop, so that way GnRH is never stimulated, LH and FSH are going to be kind of kept in check in those cases. So as a person who's on oral contraceptives, I would expect their LH and FSH level to be low or high? Be low because I'm actually causing that negative feedback loop, right? Because I'm giving them estrogen and progestin. It should cause levels to be low. Versus someone who had, say, a hysterectomy, what would their levels be? LH and FSH. Those would be high because, again, they have lost, they don't have that function anymore. They can't produce the estradiol, so then you can find that actually those levels would be high, right? They have nothing to stimulate, essentially. <coughs> So you can kind of keep that in mind how those changes will occur. Um, you know, postmenopausal women expect those LH and FSH levels to be high in those cases, right? Okay. Um, and again, we will still have the endometrium that will proliferate, but by having that combination of estrogen and progesterone, kind of keep it in check. And then eventually there will uh, be like a, a week-long period of placebo pills that they'll take. Uh, will allow for menstruation to actually occur. We'll call that the withdrawal bleeding uh, that happens with that. Okay. Okay. Other things you can find, again, this is ways that um, some women can actually track things like body temperature to determine when they're ovulating. Uh, so that way, you know, if they're having trouble conceiving, they can try to find out, okay, well, based on this, we know that, you know, around uh, the actual, um, the cycle day itself, we say, okay, well, based on this, I kind of know that, um, you know, the temperature is going to peak up around a certain point. That kind of goes along with this kind of LH peak that occurs here. So, okay, well, once the LH surge happens, you know, that's when the ovulation is occurring. That way, the woman can better predict when she's actually ovulating itself. And there's a ton of apps that are out there. You can put in all these different things like your temperature and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, it will kind of tell you, like, hey, hey, today's the day. You're ovulating. Get to it. You know, that sort of thing. All right. Um, so menopause, we mentioned this is going to be where basically we have that cessation of ovarian function uh, in menses. Basically, you're going to find the ovaries are going to be changing. Um, they're decreasing the actual estradiol that they're producing themselves. Um, and, again, this not 
uh, decreasing the LH and FSH. Those levels will still be high in those patients, um, but there's no, no negative feedback loop actually happening there. Um, usually occurs around age, after age 50 or so, but it could be earlier depending if someone, their friends has like ovarian cancer and they had them removed or all kinds of different uh, situations that may be the case there, right? Again, um, so what are the symptoms of menopause? No. Hmm? Hot flat. My mom called them power surges, but I thought it was a very positive way of looking at it. <laughs> Power surge, you got to get around, get moving, right? Um, yeah, so those are typically caused by vasomotor disturbances due to a lack of estrogen, right? So that can be one thing. Um, you know, what other symptoms might you see? Hmm? Yeah. Mood swings, potentially, yeah. Somebody has some mood swing, mood alterations due to lack of estrogen, right? Could be one thing. Yes. One of the other big things you find kind of atresia of or an atrophy of the, the vaginal tissue as well, right? So, again, if you uh, lack that estrogen, you're going to find that things like the, the urethra and the vagina tend to atrophy. Uh, they don't produce a lot of uh, lubrication, so you can find very dry uh, vaginas, and they can uh, develop in dyspareunia. Anyone know that, what that is? Uh, pain, pain during sex, basically, right? So, again, if they have very like, painful sex, it could be related to just they can't really produce any secretions like they used to before due to the lack of estrogen, right? Which is why, in some cases, you may actually find that you only want to, um, say, use, like, topical estrogen products. You may actually give topical estrogen um, intravaginally, and that will actually help to develop that tissue again to help produce secretions and, and help with some of those vaginal symptoms you see. Those are typically some of the more kind of problematic ones that people run into um, that you may not hear a lot about, especially, like, you're talking – if I was talking to my mom about her power uh, surges, I hope she's not talking about her, uh, you know, uh, dyspareunia and all that as well. I just don't want to hear about it, right? Anywho, but some other effects due to that lack of estrogen, you can see some other kind of longstanding issues like risk for um, atherosclerosis goes up as you lose those estrogen. Estrogen typically has a uh, protective sort of effect uh, for coronary disease. And then osteoporosis will also um, uh, be a bigger risk because less estrogen means you're going to have more osteoclast activity pulling up calcium out of the bone. Birth control, would that, like, it? Because you're getting the hormones from birth control? Um, yeah, so for instance, um, normally what you're going to find is that if you think about doses between, because in, in menopausal women, you can give them hormone replacement therapy or HRT. Typically, those are a lot lower doses of estrogens that I'm having to give because I'm just trying to replace what the ovaries would have been producing anyway, as opposed to um, with or contraceptives. I'm giving them a uh, much bigger dose to try to shut down the whole system. Basically, I'm trying to overwhelm the system and cause that negative feedback loop to be kind of on lockdown, essentially, right? But yeah, so typically lower doses in this case because we do find some negatives uh, potentially by giving these women uh, too much estrogen, right? So for instance, they have uh, you know high risk uh, breast cancer history in their family, maybe they're estrogen receptor dependent uh, breast cancer. They have an extra extra estrogen around can be problematic for them, right? Um, so we'll talk more about that much more in, in farm two reproductive health stuff. But um, you know, deciding what type of estrogen product and who's the right patient for it can be a very difficult sort of question to answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, fertilization and pregnancy. So again, let's say we have the magical meeting of the sperm and the egg. What actually happens? So the natural fertilization, um, you can see that over 300 uh, million sperm are enter into the female uh, during ejaculation there. And again, only about 100 of these actually live to enter the fallopian tube. So again, there's a high uh, attrition rate sort of there as far as the sperm goes. And a lot of them are going to be uh, lost in the shuffle, so to speak. So what happens here is the fertilization actually happens in the ampulla here, uh, the uterine tubes, right? So basically, you're going to have the actual um, uh, the graphene follicles are going to release the egg into the fallopian tubes, and this is where we're actually going to have the, the implantation occurring here, actually uh, right up here. Um, and remember that that acrosome. Uh, it's going to contain those lysosomal enzymes like hyaluronidase. And right there at the head of the sperm is actually going to be, uh, and again, I don't think this is an actual representation of what it looks like. It looks much more dramatic than what it actually is probably happening, but. <laughs> Basically, it's going to be um, helping to, to start to break down that tissue and allow for entry, right? So you're going to have things like stimulation of calcium and then release of those enzymes that allow it to uh, digest that zona pelliculata, um, uh, or uh, pelliculata, I should say, uh, start to break that down, and then will allow for the, um, uh, the sperm to kind of enter and kind of fuse with the ova. Here you can kind of see what this will look like. So again, this is the outer uh, portions of the ovum here. You're going to find that the acrosome will then start to break down. It's going to start to release and digest this, and then it can kind of implant itself, and then you have the actual fusion itself occur there. Okay, so again, looking at um, changes in the oocyte after fertilization. So again, imagine you have your um, first meiotic divisions here. Again, the polar bodies, again, they're going to be kind of split off and they will die. Uh, but eventually, once you have fertilization happen here, they're, they're going to fuse. Uh, zygotes again start to undergo, I'm sorry, it goes this direction. Uh, zygotes are going to form together. They're going to combine, and then they can start to undergo mitosis, right? So that really rapid mitosis starts to occur there. And again, um, are the sperm and the, and the egg, are they haploid or diploid? They're haploid, and then when they combine together, they are now? They've so got both copies of their chromosomes, and now they can start to replicate via mitosis. Then you can see here, um, 
how these are going to be developing. Again, this is when the actual fertilization here occurs here in the ampulla. You're going to find uh, sort of have these kind of initial uh, mitotic divisions here, and eventually this will then implant into the uterus itself. And again, hopefully that uterus is still um, very well developed from all that nice progesterone and estrogen that was around, and then you have uh, the implantation and then development of the fetus itself. All right. Um, again, usually about the sixth day or so after fertilization is when the blastocyst is going to implant on the endometrium. And typically by the seventh to tenth day, you're normally going to find it's going to be completely buried. And this is going to develop into uh, eventual a fetus. And also what else goes along with the fetus? The placenta also will develop as well, right? And so that's really important. We make sure we have that developing. Okay, so looking at the implantation of the blastocyst, how can you tell if someone is pregnant or not? What's a normal lab you're looking for? HCG, right? So again, if you like pee on a uh, on a stick, it's usually going to be testing for HCG. That's how you can tell if you're pregnant or not. So um, this is a human chorionic gonadotropin, and this is one of those things that's going to be um, releasing from the blastocyst during the actual implantation phase itself, right? Basically, what this is helping to do is it will help to keep the, the corpus luteum alive, so that way it's continuing to release estrogen uh, and progesterone, and that prevents menstruation from occurring, right? So you need that HCG around to keep the corpus luteum active, keep making sure that endometrial tissue is staying active itself and not trying to uh, slough off and, and cause menstruation to occur there, right? Um, Typically, you're going to find it declines by about the 10th week or so from the actual blastus. And then uh, this is when the actual placenta itself can then take over and actually start to release things like estrogen and progestin. So again, typically with pregnant patients, you're going to find those levels uh, of estrogen and progestin will go above what would be normally in a non-pregnant patient. Um, but that's due to the placenta actually generating itself, right? So that's when you see um, typical changes in, in those, those patients that are due to those really high levels of um, uh, estrogen and progesterone. You know, looking at secretion here, so imagine um, during the months of pregnancy, again, HCG is going to be in high levels initially. And again, that's to keep that corpus luteum alive. And then as levels go on, you're going to find progesterone and estrogen continue to climb uh, as a result of the placenta. All right. And then as a pregnancy is going to keep progressing here, you actually see that HCG will then peak up um, around here and then uh, it'll still be present. You can still measure it in your patients uh, for sure all the way throughout the pregnancy. But then we'll go back down once the actual baby's born itself. Again, you can find HCG is being produced um, here by the placenta. The ovaries are still kind of taking over the estrogen and progestin levels initially, uh, but as it continues on with development, you're going to see that it's going to be much more predominantly with the placenta actually generating all these hormones here. And eventually, by the end of it, it's going to be just very, very prim primarily the, the placenta, and the ovaries are kind of taking a very uh, backseat sort of means as far as releasing estrogen and progestin. And then looking at actual levels itself, uh, looking at number of weeks of pregnancy, you can see here how the levels are going to go up uh, pretty exponentially here for, for a while. And then we'll start to kind of go back down uh, towards the end of pregnancy, as you'll, as you'll see. So we kind of have a peak early on in the first couple of months, and then we'll go back down uh, lower. Still be above what it would be, would be normally, but still be high. All right, and then looking at the amniotic sac and the placenta itself. So what, what does the placenta do for us? Well, yeah, so certainly it secretes hormones, but what else does it do for the baby? So it can prevent infections, it's going to be providing nutrients and things like that. This is the kind of the, the main conduit between mom and the baby is to help provide blood flow, provide oxygen, all of that, right? So again, this is the very important here. Uh, again, this is why things like, you know, um, you know drug exposure in, in pregnant females is so important because this is a very um, uh, susceptible stage for the fetus when it's developing, especially during that first trimester. And you have also organogenesis occurring here. Uh, this is where early exposure of things like, you know, antiepileptics and other type of drugs can really cause some significant um, uh, triadogenesis, right? When we said triadogenesis is when you have some sort of birth defect due to uh, some sort of exposure to the mom um, or the mom had during pregnancy, right? Again, there's some cases where you can actually do, um, you know, drawing fluid off of here because this will have the fetal cells in it. You can actually test for things like uh, the chromosomes that the baby has. Uh, nowadays, we can actually do blood samples where um, you'll find some cross-contamination of fetal blood into the mom. And that's what we actually did for, for both of our kids. We did um, genetic testing to find out, okay, well, one, is it a boy or girl? It was really kind of depressing because when we did those tests, it came back and it says, um, no presence of Y detected. I said, well, it could still be there. Maybe you just didn't detect it yet. Maybe. They, it wasn't there at all. <laughs> but anywho, but yeah, so you can either do it via amniocentesis. Obviously, this is a, a bit of a risky procedure. Why is that? There's a big fat needle going near the baby's head. Not great. So you can do it via blood sample, which again is becoming more, um, uh, more and more uh, you know, as costs go down and things like that would become more available, that can also be another uh, route to do that, right? Um, again, usually taking samples around 16 weeks or so, and then we start to uh, test for those sorts of things. Okay. And again, looking at um, the actual blood flow going to the baby itself, again, we're going to have these umbilical arteries that actually deliver fetal blood to the placental vessels. 
right? So again, in this case, we're talking about arteries. Uh, they're taking blood away from the baby over to the placental vessels. Uh, blood's going to be circulating within the placenta itself, um, and it's going to be returning via the umbilical vein. Okay, so again, this is how we're getting oxygen-rich blood back to the baby. So it's going to be through these umbilical veins here. Again, as maternal blood is getting sent to the uh, placenta itself, you're going to find this is where the actual exchange occurs here, both of oxygen, uh, of nutrients, of uh, waste products from the baby. All that's going to be happening right here in the placenta, right? And again, they're going to be mixing, but it's basically going to be kept apart, um, you know, by a very thin layer for, uh, for the most part. Thing you find here, um, looking at uh, things like you know molecules diffusing across the tissues. Remember, we talked about in some cases you can actually have like ions and things like that being trapped based on the changes in, in pH from like the placental tissue or placental amniotic fluid uh, to the mom. But again, things like oxygen and nutrients definitely need to be able to cross pretty easily uh, to make sure that it can circulate from the maternal. Uh, um, uh, blood supply over to the fetal blood supply and return to them, right? Carbon dioxide and waste products are going to come from the fetus over to be delivered to the mom. Um, but again, you can find transfer of lots of things. So for instance, like alcohol can diffuse over and get exposed to the fetus uh, very easily, which can develop into fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome, right? It could be one thing you can develop with um, uh, a lot of uh, drug exposure. And again, anyone ever heard of neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS? If you ever work in a NICU, you'll see this with uh, some regularity, unfortunately, but we have a lot of moms who will uh, uh, be exposed to drugs throughout their pregnancy, whether opioids or cocaine or all sorts of other things. And then um, just like the mom's addicted to these drugs, the baby becomes addicted, so to speak. So that way, when they come out of the mom, now you've cut off their drug exposure and now they undergo withdrawal. So now they have issues where they are um, not regulating their temperature very well. They're not eating very well. They're very sad little babies because oftentimes we have to kind of give them supplements, uh, <laughs> say, for instance, like morphine. If their moms are addicted to opioids, we have to give them morphine to try to prevent them from withdrawing. So that way they can kind of chill out and continue to grow a little bit. Um, but a uh, very sad situation, but you you run into it with, with uh, some regularity. Hmm? Um, yeah, any kind of opioid is going to potentially cause that uh, fetus. Again, they're psychologically not addicted to it because they don't really have anything going on up there, so to speak. But they are certainly physiologically addicted to it, right? Um, again, they are very, um, uh, you know, they cry a lot. They're just not eating well. There's just lots of issues that come about from that the abstinence syndrome they have there. Yes, sir. The, uh, blood, uh, uh, what about, like, blood there, so there is a chance to have some transmittal that can occur there, right? So the cells may be able to move across, um, but again, it's meant to try to keep it as separated as possible, so still allow for flow of, uh, of materials as needed, but try to prevent, you know, say, infection from uh, getting to the fetus itself. But it's possible, but it's uh, less common, you might think. Okay. So when you're looking at maternal changes, so the things you would expect to see is, uh, as the mom develops in, in the pregnancy here. So again, typically uh, weight gain, you're going to find most of the weight gain occurs here in the last two trimesters. So typically around 25 to 35 pounds or so, um, you know, about eight pounds of fetus or so. It's kind of a weird way to talk about it, but I got, a, got eight pounds of fetus here for seven months. Um, you get about four pounds of it's going to be things like amniotic fluid, the placental, fetal membranes. Uh, three pounds is just going to be an increase in the size of the uterus. About two pounds is uh, increase in the breast tissue, right, because it's getting ready for, for milk production. Um, you have some uh, definitely five pounds of extra fluid in the blood and ECF. I don't know if any of you guys have dealt with, um, I shouldn't say dealt with, but have lived with a pregnant lady before. <laughs> One of the things you'll see is that they are definitely pumping blood for two. And so things like exercise tolerance is going to go down. Um, very, um, you know, just getting around the house can sort of leave them kind of huffing and puffing because, again, they're having uh, increased blood volume. So they're having to get that blood around and, and deliver it. And so it can be, uh, you know, one of those things that they're just like, man, I get so tired now. And just even rolling around in the bed can be a problem, you know. So things like that you'll notice with some of these uh, pregnant patients. Um, and, again, the, the fat accumulation that can occur here is, again, going to be variable depending on the patient, what their diet was like during uh, pregnancy itself, right? Um, generally, you find to um, increase metabolism, and generally, they get, uh, will have an overheating sensation, especially if you get pregnant during the July months, uh, especially in your third trimester. Not fun, right? Not that I experienced it, but I had to, you know, was around for it. Other things, look at um, the nutritional requirements because, again, they are eating for two. Some people um, uh, will uh, need additional requirements of things like, you know, iron because, again, what do we say about their blood flow or their blood production? going up because again they need to supply blood for the fetus as well so the iron production is going to go up um vitamin d and calcium because again the baby's going to have bones that are going to be developing vitamin k things like you know clotting formation things like that and then uh, looking at cardiac output is typically up by about 30 to 40 percent by uh, week 27 of pregnancy so it's gone up pretty significantly um you also find things like increased aldosterone and fluid retention so i think that may, may manifest they have a lot of swelling of the lower extremities, so like a lot of swelling in their ankles and their feet. So again, my wife would complain like, man, these shoes just don't fit anymore. A lot of it do that fluid retention because of things like aldosterone, right? 
And again, about one to two extra liters of blood in the cardiovascular system at the time of birth. So you get a lot of, quite a bit of a fluid accumulation. And then uh, what you actually notice is afterwards, there's a ton of diuresis that occurs as well. So again, um, uh, you know, and again, probably should be giving so many stories about my wife, but just anecdotally, what I've experienced is that after the uh, actual birth has occurred, just a lot, a lot of urination, because again, they're getting rid of all that extra fluid they don't really need anymore, because now the baby's been born, right? And then looking at uh, respiration, again, oxygen consumption has gone up pretty significantly, about 20%. Uh, increased minute ventilations, so again, looking at the actual tidal volume and, and speed of breathing is going to go up. Um, increased sensitivity to CO2, right? So you're going to be even more sensitive to uh, the building of levels of CO2 to increase respiration. And then also, uh, you can have a hard time kind of getting good inspirations because if you have eight pounds of feet, it's pressing up on your diaphragm. Guess what? So again, you know, you're you're getting hot. You have exercise intolerance. You have all this extra blood and all this extra weight. And now all of a sudden you have the baby pressing up and you can't really get a good deep breath. It's, it's no fun to be pregnant from what, I've, what I can surmise. I wouldn't recommend it. For at least half of you in here, just kidding. Um, this used to be the case. The first time, the first year I taught here, there's only four guys in the whole class, so it's definitely good to see uh, good diversity uh, amongst uh, the PA students. Anywho, um, again, looking at labor, we talked about this before. This is actually where we have those uterine contractions are going to be stimulated by the head of the, hopefully the head of the fetus going to be pressing down to the cervix. Again, that stimulates uh, the anterior posterior pituitary. And posterior pituitary to release the oxytocin is going to help to increase that squeeze there. Um, not only that, but you have things like prostaglandins from the placenta can also help with like ripening of the cervix, getting it ready uh, for dilation so the baby can kind of come through. Um, and other things include things like uh, corticotropin releasing um, hormone or CRH actually gets released from the placenta itself. All these things are kind of helping get it ready for the actual birth uh, to occur. And then you can see here, uh, imagine the, the head's going to be kind of increasing its uh, pressure there on the cervix. Um, this is going to be releasing things like prostaglandin, which are going to help to uh, be stimulated by cortisol. This helps to kind of ripen that cervix and get it ready for, for, um, uh, for labor. Um, also, things like estrogen is going to increase uh, during uh, this process here as well. It's going to increase levels of oxytocin receptors. So again, they're more sensitive to the effect of oxytocin, and that's going to help get that bigger, stronger ut uterine squeeze there. All right. And then looking at lactation. So again, uh, actually looking at the actual mammary gland structure here, you're going to find that it's composed of uh, separate lobes um, separated by this adipose tissue there, as you'll see. And then basically each lobe is going to be kind of uh, made up of these glandular alveoli. So very similar to kind of the alveoli in the lungs, but these are going to be filled uh, with milk uh, that will be secreted during lactation itself, right? So basically it's going to be flowing from the lobules uh, into this lactiferous uh, duct here and then out through the nipple. And remember, uh, two main hormones are going to be um, uh, involved here are going to be what? Prolactin and then also, right, what stimulates that? Right, suckling or like the hearing the baby cry in those cases. Remember I talked about that um, episode of The Office where Kevin's like, wee, wee, you know, <laughs> that's that sort of thing. But that can help to stimulate uh, release of oxytocin and, and prolactin, help to stimulate the uh, lactation process there, right? So again, by nursing, uh, actually maintains really high levels of prolactin um, uh, being secreted there uh, and actually will inhibit that prolactin inhibiting hormone. So that's a good thing. We want extra prolactin around um, to help make sure we are helping to produce that milk itself, right? Um, again, also those uh, by the nursing will stimulate oxytocin secretion and will stimulate uh, contraction of those ducts there, right? So that actually helps with the milk let down itself. And again, looking at things like your um, estrogen, progestin, and prolactin levels, you're going to see here um, that um, during the birth itself, you're going to notice here that estrogen and progestin levels actually get, say, pretty low for the most part um, during, the, um, uh, during the actual lactation phase. Why, why do you think that would be? Do I need to ovulate if I'm actively feeding another person? Probably not, right? So it's kind of like natural birth control, so to speak, where actually by having those, those prolactin levels elevated, and actually what you can find is patients who are maybe not even lactating um, but are having a hard time getting pregnant, sometimes it's related back to prolactin levels being too high, and that can actually um, try to uh, inhibit ovulation from occurring in the first place. Um, now, again, is breastfeeding the uh, perfect way to prevent uh, pregnancies from occurring? I can tell you, no, it's not. It actually uh, can still happen, uh, especially later on. But early on, as your body's thinking, hey, I need to feed this other person, keep them alive. I can't think about getting pregnant right now. This is kind of a nice inhibitory effect on ovulation from occurring, right? And Phoebe was the best little happy accident we ever had, you know? <laughs> anyway, um, so that's it for this section. Any questions uh, that I can answer on this? Yes, sir. Uh, slide 88. You said CO levels. Carbon monoxide levels. Yeah. Mother are raised. So CO increases 30 to 40%. Cardiac output. Oh. Yeah. They don't part, start producing carbon monoxide. Be... <laughs> <laughs> they turn into a diesel engine. And then... <laughs> no. Any other questions I can answer? Yes, sir. 
Can you just explain prolactin a little bit more, that last slide? Yeah. Um, so basically what you can find is that typically prolactin will have sort of an inhibitory effect on the menstrual cycle, right? Um, so you're going to find that as the prolactin levels increase, again, typically um, this is when you're going to be having, um, and this is actually one of the things you'll see, because if you have um, women who start um, feeding their kid formula, right? So instead they're not going to be um, uh, actually feeding the kid breast milk, you can actually find those levels will start to drop back down, right? Because again, the body detects I'm not really needing these prolactin around to produce this milk because it's not going to use. So it'll actually go back down to, to regular levels, right? And the person can start ovulating again. However, someone who's actually uh, actively breastfeeding, those levels will stay high and they'll actually help to prevent um, things like increases in, in estrogen and progesterone um, in order to prevent ovulation from occurring again, right? So after you gave birth, you're not as likely. Yeah, yeah, because again, think physiologically, like, hey, if, uh, if I'm feeding this little tiny person here, I want to keep them alive. I need those nutrients and things like that to keep them alive. If I get pregnant again, that's going to be diverting nutrients from the baby uh, to produce another person, right? So again, that's this, uh, basically the, the one way to think about it, I suppose. So how long until it's back to normal so you can start pumping them out again? <laughs> um, how long yeah, before you can start pumping them out? Yeah, it, it depends. You know, so it depends. Uh, it's entirely on the woman. Uh, it depends on uh, if they actually... Um, you know, how much they're breastfeeding, if they're using a combination, maybe even sooner, so they're feeding and uh, breastfeeding in formula. Um, you know, sometimes you can be breastfeeding 100%, and then several months after, I think, um, my kids are 19 months apart, so again, mine is about 10 months or so before, you know, uh, when my, my wife started, my mom, my wife, that's a, that's a Freudian slip, which I won't delve further into right now, but... <laughs> But when my wife uh, gave birth, it was roughly 10 months or so before she got pregnant again, right? So, again, it just depends on, on the woman, uh, maybe longer, maybe shorter. Uh, again, not a foolproof way to prevent pregnancy, as it, as it turns out. That's why intrauterine devices can be such a good uh, thing afterwards, right? Anyway. So, so, on the Y93, mm -hmm. when the estrogen progesterone levels are decreased when prolactin, wouldn't that cause an increase in the so the product in itself is what's feeding that. So the reason why the estrogen and progestin levels are low is because it's feeding back and trying to prevent. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Any other questions? So that, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the umbilical veins will be oxygenated, the umbilical arteries are deoxygenated. And what's actually kind of interesting is that after, straight after birth, um, you can actually use that umbilical vein as a central line, basically. Remember how we talked about this peripheral uh, venous axis and their central venous axis? Usually central is kind of leading directly into the uh, vena cava, right back to the heart. So in those kids, we can actually have an umbilical catheterization that allows us to have central axis without having to get like a line placed like either through the groin or through the, through the arms and actually get to, uh, to a central flow, which is kind of cool. We'll do that in NICU pretty commonly. Any other questions? All right, if not, uh, we'll have our review tomorrow, I think, and I'll see you guys then.